Hello friends, <laughs> how are you? I'm Mari Ferger and today I'm going to talk about the origins of Carnival in Portugal. I've made a poll on my various social media to see if you guys were interested in knowing about pagan traditions of Portugal. The poll was quite positive, but I noticed some people were a little bit confused and didn't quite know how or where to place Portugal in the map <laughs> some point into South America and some to the Middle East and some people actually thought their own country was at war with Portugal. Weird. <laughs> Portugal is in Europe, my friends. It's an European country, right? So, since I'm working and living in here, why not uh, speak about <laughs> the pagan traditions of the country? I'm starting to take a deeper look uh, into the pagan past around here, before Germanic and Roman and even before Celtic influences, going into a deeper analysis of the indigenous pagan past as well as animistic conceptions in what is nowadays Portugal, but also Spain and the Iberian Peninsula as a whole. But today I'm going to focus on the origins of carnival in Portugal. Not just in Portugal, but its origins as a whole and then remoting to Portugal as well. Because I will start by speaking about the figure of the careto, <laughs> plural careto, so you might understand what they are, because there are many of them and they are important figures, not just during carnival, but as a reflection of the ancient pagan celebrations of fertility and the animistic beliefs towards the spiritual persons expressing the life-giving powers of nature. Then I shall speak about a specific group of Kerech from Podens, uh, which is a place in northeastern Portugal. Last December 2019, they have just become recognized as part of World Heritage by UNESCO. Congratulations are in order. <laughs> so, after speaking about the Kerech, I'm going to share with you those news. Speaking about the pagan origins of this, the, the Kerech, and the festivity around them, and then I shall jump to the origins of Carnival as a whole, and then in Portugal. I do hope you enjoy this video. Let's get started. <laughs> so, let's start with the figure of the Kerech. Uh, what exactly is it? There are many different Kerech from different parts of northern Portugal, but all of them somewhat follow the same idea. The Kerech as a whole is a prehistorical tradition with a connection to Celtic religious rituals of magical practices related to agrarian fertility cults. This tradition is still practiced in some regions of Portugal, namely in the villages of Podens, but also in Vila Boa de Osleão, Vinhais, Vars and Lazarim, whose caretos are a bit different and the masks they wear are made of older wood, decorated with horns. This tradition takes place during winter and in certain regions during carnival, although it wasn't a tradition originally linked to Carnival. It was later included in Carnival, somewhat due to the religious conflicts between Christianity and Paganism. This is one of the oldest traditions being practiced in Portugal to this day. It is definitely pre-Roman, and even though it has clear relations to Celtic religious practices, this tradition is far older than that. A careto, the figure, is a sort of devil on the loose. It represents evil incarnated in opposition to the goodness people strive to achieve through their deeds on their daily lives throughout the year. But on the days of late winter, in mid-February, people are allowed to wear the skin of the devil <laughs> during carnival. Carnival is the time of the year when certain unacceptable behaviors are allowed and what is forbidden throughout the year is permitted on this season. So the caretos end up being the personification of the wild spirit 
free from religious moral and conduct. In a religious society, the Kareto is unleashed chaos, and religious rules and laws have no value for those who wear the skin of the devil during this celebration. Everything that was forbidden or is forbidden is permitted on this celebration. It's total chaos to let loose as much euphoria and joy as possible because by the end of the celebrations, everything unfortunately goes back to normal and people have to return to their lives, they have to behave, they have to continue to follow the moral code of the church, everything will be forbidden again. It's a shame. It has been three months of cold, hardships, snows, no work on the fields, the earth is dead, nothing grows. And so, for farming communities, uh, being shut in at home for at least three months, it's obviously hard and quite depressive. So, this is a time for celebration, to come out again. Spring is just one month at hand, getting closer to the season of fertility and the rebirth of the soils. So, the church allowed these pagan celebrations to continue. Of course, the Kareto is nowadays seen as a sort of devil due to the personification of chaos, euphoria, freedom, madness, in opposition to the very restrictive behavior and conduct of the church. But this celebration indeed comes from a pagan past, a very, very ancient pagan past. The connotation with the, um, the celebration of life and fertility is still perceptible in this celebration. After the cold months, when everything is dead, um, during late winter, when the days start to grow longer and light comes back into the world, and spring is at hand, people felt the need to arouse the powers of fertility. The figure of the Kareto is actually a very animistic understanding of the spiritual reality that surrounds the human beings. <laughs> the Kareto is the personification of the powers of fertility, and people dress as the spirits of fertility, precisely to arouse fertility, to call upon its powers, to incorporate the life-giving powers of nature that is necessary on the fields and in animals and obviously among mankind. It is this animistic relationship with the life-giving forces and fertility powers that are still slipping during late winter. So people dress themselves uh, in the skin of these spirits, pretending to be these spiritual powers and make a lot of noise and dancing, shouting, in order to wake up fertility. Human survival depends on the fertility of the land, so it's time to provoke a reaction on that fertility that is highly needed. So people dressed as Kareto um, to try to awake the fertility powers of the land and the fertility of human beings as well, the fertility of women to be more precise. This is the time when young boys are allowed to get closer to girls, shake them up, touch them, having that sort of physical contact with them. After all, they are dressed as the spirits of fertility, the personification of sexual arousement, which, well, with the church, this was obviously forbidden, it was absolutely outrageous, a moral deviation. <laughs> Due to Christianity, people start to have a lot of restrictions, there is an austere moral canon to be followed, there is a bitter social ju judgment. So this is the time to let loose and find women, to seek them out. Which again, remotes to a pagan past, seeking out the feminine fertility powers of the natural world, also expressed in all living things, including in women. So. Yes, the Kareto goes after women, shaking them up as an act of sexual nature. Most likely in a pagan past, this was part of a celebration for young boys to become men, become adults. An initiation process to seek out a partner 
um, in this celebration, praising fertility and life. So indeed, with Christianity, this spirit of nature, fertility, sexuality, gained other connotations, directly being associated with fear, evil, um, the devil, immorality, danger and destruction, due to its behavior. Dressing up as a careto uh, he is wearing a sort of supernatural power, which transmits the wearer strength, power, vitality, energy. And this energy is shaken and awakes the sleeping nature still under the covers of winter. <laughs> there is um, also the tradition of burning, the burning of a great careto, a sort of wicker man, remoting to Celtic origins although it's actually a tradition before the Celts, the burning and destruction of this fertility spirit. Nature has been awakened at last, now the spirits of fertility and sexuality must be destroyed and returned to their original habitat, the Earth. Uh, their objective is done and it's time to let them go. So it's, it's a very interesting animistic belief, still very much alive, and in the case of the Caretos of Podence, specifically of Podence, they were finally of officially recognized as part of world heritage by UNESCO. So it's very good news. It's a tradition that was saved and won't disappear that soon. And the animistic beliefs, in a way, are still kept moving, are still alive. Which I think it's absolutely beautiful and totally wicked. <laughs> so, one specific group of Caretos from Podence last December 2019 were classified by UNESCO as belonging to World Heritage. Congratulations! <laughs> Congratulations to the inhabitants of Podence, the villages of Podence, who over the centuries have kept alive this unique and beautiful tradition. Congratulations for the capacity of safeguarding this tradition and for its renewal and, obviously, continuation. And of course, Congratulations to all those who contributed to the appreciation and preservation of this cultural heritage. The Caret of Podence mark the carnival's debauchery and festivity in northeastern Portugal, uh, with very bright and colorful suits and rattles at the waist to make a lot of noise, waking up the world from its wintry slumber. As said before, in the whole region of uh, northern Portugal or northeastern Portugal, uh, there are several types of caretos, but those of Podence, specifically of Podence, are distinguished from the others by the rattles they have hanging from their waist. So they are quite noisy. And don't worry, if anyone wants to visit this part of the country uh, to see these creatures on the, on the loose or performing <laughs> during winter and most prominent during the month of February, during carnival, it's perfectly safe, more or less. <laughs> this is a time of sexual courting, but also quite the playful festivity. Now, speaking of carnival, what are its origins in Portugal? Let's see. Carnival is probably the annual festival whose origins proves to be the most controversial of all. This is doubtless due to the fact that more than any other celebration of the annual calendar, it comes from the deep conflict between Christianity and paganism, and to the divergence between body and spirit. This transformed Carnival into a, an event on the threshold uh, of the religious and the profane. From this anthropological tension emerged its socially transgressive character, um, the, the euphoria, madness, going beyond what is socially acceptable, and going beyond all moral notions. Carnival uh, most likely comes from ancient Greece and Rome, and possibly even Egypt. So let's try to see each case, greatly summarized. <laughs> Carnival may have had its origins in ancient Greek agrarian cults, with the emergence of agriculture. But these celebrations um, are more noticeable in, a, an archaeolo in archaeological terms around 3300 BC, beginning of Bronze Age for ancient Greece, or uh, 
in the Hellenic world, to be more precise. Uh, people began to celebrate the fertility and productivity of the soils, and later on, in association with the worship of the god Dionysius, in the great festival called Dionysia, uh, which took place in ancient Athen Athens. And apparently, opening up this festivity, a type of chariots or carts in the shape of a boat were brought, which in Latin they were called carum navales, uh, something like a boat chariot or a boat cart, hence why carnival may derive from these sort of transportations that brought in them naked men and women and masked dancers and men with bells who chased away darkness and chased away winter and evil spirits. This whole performance served to announce or proclaim the coming of spring and fertility. Now, it's also possible that carnival, the word, might derive from another Latin expression, carnem, carnem levare, um, which, which means to remove or to be free from the flesh. This is because already in the Middle Ages, these old pagan festivities were incorporated by the Catholic Church, uh, marking the last days of freedom before the restrictions imposed by Lent. But before this association with Lent, or before uh, trying to incorporate the, the ancient pagan festivities of agrarian cults into Catholicism, uh, carnival, not as a word, but the, the festivity as a whole, may indeed have its origins in the Roman celebrations, which included orgies, but of course, <laughs> which took place in Rome between the months of November and December, and were called Carum Navalis, the same boat-shaped chariots, a tradition somewhat borrowed from the Greeks. At the time, according to several sources, there was an, an apparent breakdown of social hierarchy uh, when everyone mingled in the public square for this festivity. You see, <laughs> in ancient Greece and Rome, there were specific celebrations and rituals where only certain members of the elite would participate. People with high social status or some high rank. And many celebrations were to affirm their position in society. But these celebrations of Carob Navales was different. They were quite different. Everyone was sort of equal. Hence, the reason why many people were naked without any sort of clothing or jewelry to identify their social rank. There was no, separ no, no separation of classes and everyone came together. And there was a lot of sex and drink as well. These celebrations were of such importance that courts and schools and everything else closed their doors during this event, and slaves were freed and people took to the streets to dance. There was horse racing, parades, paper fights, uh, throwing colorful papers to one another, uh, hump races, yes, hump, <laughs> hag throwing, and other amusements generalized the euphoria. And at the opening of these feasts to the god Saturn in Rome, shaped like carts or chariots, appeared on, on the main road of the city, the Comanos or the Comanos Maximus. And these boat-shaped carts carried naked men and women. <laughs> However, before Greeks and Romans and their wonderful orgies, uh, the Romans, <laughs> this festivity probably originated in ancient Egypt, or even much earlier than that, as there are evidences of prehistoric festivals held in honor of the resurgence or rebirth of spring. And there was already this reversal of social positions. So this is carnival in its essence, the celebration of the coming of spring and fertility. And within societies, it is represented by a reversal um, ritual of sorts in which social roles and, uh, are reversed and norms on social behavior are suspended. So indeed, there is this fantasy implied to reverse the social roles, to become something we are not. 
Hence, also the reason why uh, for the use of masks and wear costumes. So probably uh, this is probably why the, the expression carnem levare, to remove or be free from the flesh, which the church associated with the restrictions of Lent, but it may have to do with assuming a fantasy, shape-shifting, to become another in these specific celebrations of social reversal, to become someone we are not by pretending to be someone else, being in their flesh, being in their body. Now, in ancient times, winter was considered to be a moment when a lot of malevolent spirits were on the loose, and the spirits had to be expelled, had to be banished to ensure the return of summer. And this is also still reflected in the Caretos of northern Portugal, uh, to make a lot of noise, to banish the spirits of winter. So dancing, shouting, wearing masks was essential to make a lot of commotion and banish the spirits of winter and to welcome the life-giving powers of the earth. Animism in its full sense. Carnival ends up being a rite of passage from darkness to light, from winter to summer or to spring, a celebration of fertility also reflected in the caretos and the sexual connotations in those figures, a rite of passage for young boys to become men, to become adults, leaving darkness and winter behind, leaving infertility behind and becoming fertile, <laughs> becoming men. And these festivities had an absolutely chaotic nature, the exaggeration of human behavior, the exaggeration of the consumption of food and drink and sex, the total enjoyment of life's pleasures. It is, after all, a celebration of life. And the, the exaggeration, the exa exaggerated enjoyment of the body for fertility rights, for fertility purposes. Of course, with the introduction of Christianity, Again, <laughs> a religion with many restrictions and many norms and rules on moral behavior, the church found itself powerless to contain these pagan orgy feasts. So the church decided, well, they had no other choice, but they decided to incorporate in its liturgical calendar this period of transgressive mimicry with its pagan roots uh, in the few days before Lent. There will be... Um, uh, strong restrictions. So this, the, ch the church allowed this celebration before those restrictions, moving this celebration to the days just before Lent. In Portugal, to designate this time of social indulgence and ritualized infringement of normal behavior, the use of the expression carnival only began to be known and used in Portugal from the 19th century onwards. Even though the expression carnival goes back to the medieval ages. In Portugal, this time was known, and it's still known as entrudo, derived from the verb entrar, which is to enter. Entrudo means the moment that announces the entrance in spring. In Portugal, people call it carnival anyway, carnaval in Portuguese, but more often than not, it is actually called entrudo, remoting to the spring celebration. And this is important to refer because carnival, the word, already comes with connotations with the church and Lent, but entrudo, on the other hand, shows a certain resistance to Christian beliefs and maintains um, a connection with the ancient pagan agrarian calendar. Most likely, Entrudo was a festivity celebrated a few days just before the coming of spring, or perhaps even just before the spring equinox, evoking the ancient myths of chaos and renewal and recreating them in theatrical battles, which was quite common uh, in this part of Europe in pre-Roman times. This necessity to express chaos and order as the personification of winter battling against the forces of spring <laughs> and from this celebration of sexual and fruitful nature and also the reenactment of primordial chaos 
Some traces still remain today in northern Portugal. On the last night of the Entrudo celebration, uh, there is a tradition of stealing and destroying the mosques of the Caretos, uh, burning them. And people dance and celebrate around the community bonfire. According to the ancient pagan calendars, um, these festivities extended from the period of the winter solstice all the way to the spring celebrations. Thus, a few months of madness and chaos. Hence, why many of these celebrations all over the place, at least in northern Portugal, last virtually all winter. But mostly, the, the bigger festivities are during Carnival, since the church was unable to completely eliminate these celebrations and was somewhat forced to introduce them in their liturgical calendar and move them to just a few days before Lent in an attempt to have some control. Just a few days of revelry, madness, chaos and euphoria instead of at least three months. The church always ruins the party. <laughs> but it's not all fun and games, mind that. There was a particularly brutal tradition during this season, which unfortunately some places in northern Portugal still continue this horrible tradition uh, during this season. You see, one of the animals characteristic of Portugal, the animal that we immediately associate with Portugal, and its traditions and historical background is the rooster. The rooster was the animal of one of the most important deities of the indigenous peoples of this part of the world. Not just pre-Roman, but pre-Celtic as well. And the deity is Endovelico, or Endovelicus, which is already a romanization of the name, so we don't know exactly the original name of of this deity, uh, the god of medicine and security, with a character both solar and tonic, uh, supernal and infernal, a god of the underworld, whose shape-shifting form was often in the form of a rooster, which is the animal representative of dawn, uh, with the rising sun, a symbol of the energy of masculine fertility. The name Endovelico, uh, the first part of the name at least, probably, I'm not sure, uh, comes from Endur or Ender or even Endre, uh, which was the name given to the wisest person of the tribe, with great wisdom and spiritual power, a sort of druid among the late Bronze Age and Iron Age tribes of Western Iberia, where it is nowadays Portugal. Anyway. Due to the masculine fertility character associated with the rooster, during these winter celebrations it was custom to kill and eat a rooster, but the tradition was to bury a rooster alive with only its head showing. And the boys, blindfolded, uh, would try to hit the rooster with a stick and kill it. The boy who killed the rooster was praised by the community and the rooster would be cooked and eaten. And this was a rite of passage for the boy who could kill or who, who would, would kill the rooster. Uh, the physical death of the rooster recalls the direct communion with the tutelary animal of the solar deities, a direct appeal to the emergence of the sun over the newly sown fields. The rooster was the sacrifice um, to call upon the fertility powers of the sun, bestowed by the solar deities, most likely by Endovelico, and later on with the introduction of Roman religious beliefs, as well as with the, the mixture of Hellenic beliefs, the rooster was also the sacrificial offering to Apollo, Hermes and Mercury. Alright my dear friends, I hope you have enjoyed this video, I hope it was useful, and let me know if you want to know a little bit more about pagan traditions of Portugal. I'm starting to explore a little bit more uh, of the pagan past in this country and I'll have a, another video for you which will, I think it will blow your mind in a way, especially in relation to the runes. Anyway, 
that's for for another time. Once again, <laughs> thank you so much for watching. See you on the next video. If you celebrate Carnival, well, enjoy it <laughs> as much as possible. Thank you so much. See you on the next video. And as always, tá por aí,